Welcome to the Honest Field Guide Podcast, a weekly show dedicated to winning in entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Ginger Birkenbuehl. I'm the CEO of Burt Creative, a leadership, brand strategy, and visual identity agency dedicated to helping scale brands and assist with their adaptability with the market. On my show, you get to eavesdrop in on intimate conversation with business leaders and inspired entrepreneurs designed to give you tips and strategies so your own business can thrive. Subscribe and join me each week for laughter, inspiration, and honest stories. Welcome back to my show, The Honest Field Guide Podcast. I am your host, Ginger Birkenbuehl. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me today. As I always say, and you've heard me say this many times before, if you are a listener of my show, you could be anywhere in the world because we are virtual now, anywhere in the world, but you've decided to come and listen to my show. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. Um, If you could please like my show, follow my show, The Honest Field Guide on any place that you have social media. If you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, and I don't know if they still allow reviews on Spotify, but if you can leave a review there, that would be great. Please tag The Honest Field Guy, tag Ginger Burke and Buell. Leave me a four-star review because you know what? Those reviews are not only great for me, but they're also great for my guests, okay? So listen, thank you so much for that. So if you are a longtime listener of my show, you know that the purpose of my Honest Field Guy podcast is really to talk about entrepreneurship. And I always want to bring like relatable stories of struggling, winning, and then scaling everyday entrepreneurs and small business owners. However, right now we're at a turning point in the United States. Like we are at on the brink of the U.S. election, November 5th, and we might for the first time elect a woman <laughs> for the first time in our great democracy. OK, so um, and here's the thing, though. I look back at the Democratic National Convention held here in Chicago and I'm in Chicago, woohoo, Chicago in August. There was a small business owner featured on stage and um, it was the last day of the convention and it was right before Vice President Harris spoke and the business was really, really small and it wasn't like a multi-generational family owned business. It wasn't like somebody that manufactures widgets and supplies. It wasn't a million dollars tech startup. It was a small business owner. Her name was Juani Romero, a woman owned small business of Mothership Coffee in Las Vegas. And by the way, she's opening her sixth store in Las Vegas. And she spoke about how the Biden Biden administration policies helped her survive and scale and thrive even in the pandemic. And I was like, I was like eating dinner with my family and like my fork dropped out of my mouth. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's a small business owner on stage talking about business. And I'm just like, how, what, what, where, 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 where am I right now? Right. So I think something's changed with the narrative around entrepreneurship. Right. I think we've reached some kind of a tipping point. So I started listening more. And I started hearing the word entrepreneurship over and over again, flying out of political folks' mouths. And then I was like, I learned that Vice President Harris has a platform called Grow Small Business and Invest in Entrepreneurs. And I was like, you know what? I got to get more. I got to find out what's going on here. So I was like, let me let me find out what's happening here. And that's actually why my guest is on my show. I'm going to talk about in a minute. But Vice President Harris had another speech. In Northampton, New Hampshire, she featured another small woman-owned business, Throwback Brewery. And I was like, okay, you know what? I got to find someone official because I want to know, am I imagining this turn of events with entrepreneurship? You know what I mean? I'm like, so I said to my friends, who do we know that's a Democrat that is deeply involved in entrepreneurship? Someone that is blue fighting in fighting for their ideas in a sea of red, right? Like, I, I don't need to talk to somebody from Illinois because listen, Illinois is, you know, we are we are blue. But I want to find out more because if this elected official can create change for entrepreneurs in a red state, they can change the entire trajectory for small businesses, small business owners in every state. And I only got one name, only one name surfaced, <laughs> one name surfaced, Congressman Morgan McGarvey from Kentucky. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Someone from Kentucky? Really? <laughs> Kentucky Derby? The Bourbon State? <laughs> what are we doing? So let me read you this. Morgan McGarvey first ran for Congress for Kentucky back in 2022 to fight for progressive values in Washington, D.C. He won against Republican businessman and political newcomer Stuart Ray. If you can believe it, McGarvey is the only Democrat in Congress representing Kentucky. Since taking office in January 2023, Congressman Gar- McGarvey, who represents the third congressional district in Kentucky, is a member of the historically black college's 
and Universities Caucus, Congressional Progressive Caucus, New Democratic Coalition, Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, and co-chairs the Congressional Bourbon Caucus. He sits on the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, focusing on disability assistance and memorial affairs and economic opportunity. Congressman McGarvey is a ranking member on the Committee for Small Business and sits on the Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Workforce Development, as well as a member of Contracting and Infrastructure Committee. I have to read you this quote also from Congressman McGarvey. This is, I, I love this quote, and my heart like soared and like exploded from my chest when I read this, okay? I'm a dad of three kids, and I know how hectic and challenging it is for families to find affordable childcare and balance shifting schedules especially navigating through the pandemic. And listen, the pandemic taught us a lot, a lot about entrepreneurship and women and, and staying at home and working. Anyway, I continue. It's a privilege that my, that Chris, my wife, is the breadwinner. <laughs> Did you hear that? His wife is the breadwinner. And that's literally the most gorgeous thing I heard today. Of our household, well, I've been in the state Senate, but we need more members of Congress who live in the day-to-day -day reality of being working parents. And let me just say this. I, I was like, this is my guy. This is my guy because I actually, back in the day when I worked at Google, I worked with a woman who launched a platform called Breadwinning Women. And the whole purpose was to try to figure out how do we help women that make a lot of money navigate a world where everybody thinks a man is supposed to do everything and make all the money the woman stays home. And, and I was like, when I read that, I was like, let's go get him on my show. So welcome, Congressman McGarvey. Oh, thank you. It's my... so great to be here. Thank you so much. And you know, you're just you're just like my hero. And I'm thinking to myself, how do I get you to Chicago? Like, what do I need to do? To get you here? Okay, listen, let's let's get started. So let's kick the elephant out of the room here. And and no yeah. offense to Ellie the elephants. Congrats on winning the WNBA championship. That's right. <laughs> um, That's but right. your wife, seriously, yeah. Like, I mean, I love that elephant. I don't like the other ones. Okay. So your <laughs> wife is a breadwinner, right? And you're totally unbothered by this, right? Like totally. Um I love breadwinning women. So we're really unique. We're very unique. We're not like everybody else. Um, so I want to understand, um, how do you represent to other men about women in leadership roles at work, um, especially in the political sphere? Yeah. And, and thanks for saying that, because I love that we're talking about my wife. She's an awesome, awesome person. And you say unbothered by it. I would say more than unbothered, proud, uh, happy, grateful. I mean, truly, I, I could not have gone down the path of public service if not for her incredible hard work, both professionally um, and, of course, still the incredible mental load that, that so many women um, are saddled with on top of that. And so, you know, I talk about it in a way of like trying to normalize it, trying to talk about it. Honestly, let, let's let's bring it up. Let's talk about let's talk about what's happened in the past. Let's talk about what's going on now. Let's talk about how we can we can normalize it. Let's talk about the double standards that exist. Like, I remember this is one of those vivid memories um, when we had our third child. So we have twins and then we have a seven year age gap. So we've got twins and then we have um, a young one. Uh, she's she's in kindergarten right now. Twins are middle school. She's in kindergarten. And this is she's probably five months old. We're going for the first day of the legislative session in January in Kentucky. I'm, I'm the Senate minority leader at the time. We have a child care just like snafu. Everything's going wrong. My wife ha can't miss one of these meetings at work and that sort of thing. I said, hey, look, it's the first day of the session. Right? We can't even vote on bills the first day in the session in Kentucky because they haven't been introduced yet. So I said, I'm just going to take her with me. It'll be great. Like, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I'll take her with me. We'll be fine. So I strap on the baby Bjorn and and take her to work, right? And the amount of like praise and the amount of oohs and ahs it was both nice and it was like, wait a second, this shouldn't happen. Right? I'm not doing anything special. And by the way, if a woman had been doing this, you'd probably be like, get your act together. Instead, I'm doing it and you're going, oh, look, isn't he a great dad? It's like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just a dad who helps because I have a wife whose career is important too. And sometimes we're going to have things where I've got something important to do and she might have to bring a kid to work or, or work from home or do that sort of thing. And that should be OK. Right. We shouldn't put all this on women. Like if you don't have this completely buttoned up 100 percent of the time, somehow you're not doing your job. And so I think we have to talk about it in these real ways, in these real ways that parents experience, because 
one kid's going to have the stomach flu or one kid's going to, you know, swallow a crown or something, you know, like something crazy is going to happen. Both parents have to pitch in and help. Let's normalize it. Um, it, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be a big deal to have women in leadership roles, in responsible roles. It should be a big deal not to have women in big roles and in leadership roles. And then we should talk about just all the natural, you know, things we have to talk about. Let's elevate women and let's recognize that, that when you have working parents, you know, you've, you've got to do things and, and talk about it. I love that. Um, and, you know, I think the other, the other piece around, you know, women in leadership roles is that women, many women make a lot more money than their husbands. I mean, I'm one of them. I'm a bread winning woman. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 Sometimes it's difficult, right? I, I always like the story of of, of uh, men are remembering what it's like to be a little boy in the playground. If the if the little boy in the playground, you know, stands up and defends a girl or doesn't bully a girl, then you know he's the one that gets bullied. So having you know an environment where you know, and sometimes it's cultural too. And this is just me speaking, of course. Um, you know, sometimes there's a, there's a culture that the the woman is not supposed to be a leader. She's not supposed to make money. She's not supposed to be as smart as a man. So that's kind of why. That's why I love, you know, talking, listening to you talk about this, because we're in a moment right now where we are trying to elect a woman president who is really, really smart and she's extremely clever and uh, very uh, po in a positive way, uh, very fierce. And uh, that's the women that I'm used to being around, like in the corporate space. I mean, that's that's my world, you know, so for some people, it's not their world. And, and that's why I love talking about this. But I want to move a little bit to you. I want to get back to you. So, um, so you, you know, I want to talk about your, like your family. Um, what was it like growing up with your family in, and tell me if I'm pronouncing this right, Louisville, Louisville? Close, close enough. <laughs> um, it's, it's I mean, close well, enough that we know you're not from here, yes. um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll let you get away with it because you're, you're trying. Um, so how know, do you pronounce it? <laughs> say it like you've just swallowed the bourbon. Uh, and it's Louisville, 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 Louisville. That's how we do it. Oh my God. It's so hard. It's like a, it's something, woo, woo. you know, it's like in my, in my throat. It's an interesting, okay. You, I got you, but. And it, and it is, it's one of those things that's like, it's so but it's natural. And if you're here and you say, Hey, we're in Louisville, nobody, nobody bats an eye. That's how, like, that's how we say it. If All you right. said, but, but you were closer. If you said Louisville, that's the one that would have gotten us right. You know? Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah. I can't, I, I love that. So I want to, I want to know, um, so did your mother work? Were you creative? Were your parents creative? Was anybody an entrepreneur? Did somebody have a small business? What was going on when you were little? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the entrepreneurship I really saw in my family came from my grandfather, um, with whom I was very, very close. Uh, I'm the seventh of eight grandchildren and, and we just had a relationship that sparked from the time from my first memories we were just close he was a groomsman in my wedding um you know we were really good friends i quoted him this morning uh to somebody I, I was telling a story about him how you know if i ever went camping with him or fishing with him or was staying at their house or doing something he was always an early riser so he'd come in at 5 five thirty, you know pitch black and because he wanted to have a buddy with him you know i'd be there and i could be in my 20s right uh and he'd come in and go hey are you up? <laughs> it's like he's one of those guys. Uh, yes, I'm up. I'm getting up. I'm getting up, Grandpa. I'm coming. Um, but you know, he he was from Appalachia, so he's from the the eastern part of our state, the southeastern part of Kentucky. Was born in in Hazard, Kentucky. Um, grew up the first part of his life in Owsley County, which was still one of the poorest counties. Um, was a, was a really smart guy, but not a lot of opportunity back then in that part of Kentucky for people. Um, managed to kind of get a little bit of schooling, do that sort of thing. But then World War II came along. Uh, he fought in World War II, like so many uh, veteran stories, then came back, went to the University of Kentucky, went to law school at the University of Kentucky, uh, but had two kids at that time, not my mom, uh, but had two kids. One of them got sick. And at that time in the late 40s, the, what they said was, you know, you've got to go somewhere high and dry. So he took the entire family out to the mountains in Arizona. Um, and the only job available for him in the mountains of Arizona was as a school teacher for every grade of school in a schoolhouse in Greer, Arizona. 
That's what he did for a year. Uh, his son, my, my uncle, got better. They came back, and he didn't know what to do. He had a law degree, you know, the, at a time when not many people did. He had this thing. So he started a law firm, and he started his own business uh, and, and in a firm that, that still exists today. Uh, and so, you know, saw that. My, my dad is also a lawyer. My mom was a teacher, um, although she didn't work most of the time I was growing up. What I think you, you asked about creative households. Um, my mom was an art teacher. So if you think of creativity, that's my mom. My dad is the complete opposite side of the brain. Uh, very logical, very data driven. Um, you know, I would not call him a high EQ guy while being a pretty high IQ guy. Uh, and we, I mean, we make, he's so low on his emotional intelligence, we can openly make fun of him for it. Um, and he's okay with it because his emotional intelligence is that low. Uh, but, you know, but he and my mom kind of make a package. But also, what I, when you said creativity, what I noticed with people like my dad or, or you know, people like my, my brother-in-law is a, a wonderful guy uh, and an engineer, creativity doesn't have to mean you're good at music or you're good at art or you're good at expressive writing. You know, uh, my dad, I think, is an incredibly creative guy when it comes to solving certain types of problems. Uh, and so I think you see creativity in lots of different ways. And when you talk about entrepreneurship, that can manifest itself. Most of our entrepreneurs aren't opening art galleries. Um, they're opening up businesses that deal with practical needs that people want addressed and how they creatively start that business, get it going, keep it going. Um, they're solving all sorts of problems that you might not, again, you might not be thinking of an artist, but I think we have to expand our definition of creative yes. thinking when we're talking about entrepreneurs. Yes, you are speaking my language. And I actually wrote an essay in Fast Company Magazine about that. Um, I'm a contributing writer for the publication. And I wrote about, you know, redefining the the idea of creativity. You know, how yeah. what's a creative person? Yeah, I mean, because I do think there is... Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur and a small business owner, and we are, like I said in the beginning, we are very different from other people, and it's because of our ability to um, think creatively, think strategically, and actually think critically and see. We can see multiple things at the same time. A lot of people that start a business, right? I mean, they really can, and I think that's what's beautiful. Um, so I'm kind of curious, you, you, and I, and I love that. I love all those stories because I do think that if you have exposure to entrepreneurship when you're young, it does change your life. It changes your life. It, it absolutely does. So, but you were working in a law firm for a while. Was it your, was it your father's firm before, you know, you started becoming a politician? Like, how did you make the leap from, you know, going to college, becoming a lawyer and then saying, you know what, I'm going to run for political office. Like, what did you see that said you're going to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this one quickly. Uh, you know, it, it's, I probably went to law school in part because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, you know, and, and everyone says a law degree is a great degree to have. What I, when I talk to people now and give, and give students advice, I always remind them that no one finishes the sentence. A law degree is a great degree to have to practice law. Um, that's really what they equip you to do when you leave law school is go practice law. So I went, uh, when I first out of law school, I went to the really kind of big, regional firm. Um, my, my grandfather's firm is a small firm, so a small law firm, uh, and um, went there and then went from there to the attorney general's office, which really more satisfied, I think, my itch for policy and, and helping people without knowing that when I went to law school. But I was not planning on running for office. I was, I was practicing law. Uh, my wife was working for Young Brands at the time, um, and we, we got pregnant. Uh, we had twins. And, you know, we had one of those stories where we went for the 24 week checkup. They said, everything looks so good. Don't come back for another month. The next day, my wife called me from work. She's laughing. She goes, you're not going to believe this. I just peed my pants. The next call I got, she's in the emergency room. Uh, her water broken <laughs> at 24 weeks. Peed her pants. Just so peed my pants, honey. Her, just peed my pants, but her, her water broke. That's she stayed cool. in labor for 10 days. We delivered the twins 14 weeks premature at a pound and a half and a pound and 15 ounces, respectively. Um, so it's like, this is how we got thrown into parenthood. And while you're sitting there in the neonatal intensive care unit and you're sleeping in hospital chairs and, and doing those sorts of things, I, I, think, I think anybody who's been through any type of experience like that knows you do a lot of thinking. 
and you say a lot of prayers and you make a lot of promises. Uh, and one of the sort of crazy promises we made is that if we, if we get out of here, when we get out of here, we're going to help make this easier for other people. Now, I don't, we had no idea what that meant. Um, but four months after the kids came home from the hospital, uh, the state senator from my area, he announced he wasn't going to run again. Um, it was a redistricting year. He knew he was going to get screwed in redistricting. I didn't think all that much about it. He did get screwed in redistricting, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but he got so screwed in redistricting that the Supreme Court threw out all the maps and oh said, yeah. everybody has three days to decide to run under the old maps. That same state senator, uh, a great guy, Tim Shaughnessy, goes, you know, I've come to, I've come to peace with my decision. I'm really not going to run. And so I had three days to decide to run for office. And given what we'd gone through, I was probably dealing with some you know, some type of PTSD from that experience still and, and having twins and being a new parent, I said, I'm in. And I, I only half joke about this. If I'd had a fourth day, I don't know if I would have said yes. I think my wife's reaction was, this is how you want to help? Right? Are you, <laughs> that are sounds are you like something crazy? I would say. Right? Are you crazy? <laughs> what um, are you going to do for me around here after you do that? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, and, and seriously, but I told her, I said, you know, it's, it's a short election, right? It's a short election. And they've already showed us what they want to do with the district. I'm only going to be able to do this for one term. Eh, that was 12 years ago. You're just, you're just too good. You're too good, <laughs> was, Congressman. You are, too, you, are just, you are just too good at your job. Uh, that's what it is. That's, like, no, that's, that, that's well, what they, happened. When they redrew the districts, they drew them in a different way. Um, and so, you know, it, it enabled me to stay. And, and what I found along the way is I actually, the Kentucky legislature is a part-time legislature. So I still practiced law while I was in the legislature, I, I was a, a practicing attorney, although I wouldn't call it a full-time practicing attorney, but you know, at least a part-time practicing lawyer um, for the entire 10 years I was in the state Senate uh, and then ran for Congress uh, at the end of it. Um, but, you know, it, it, was a, it was a great way to kind of get into it and, and to discover what policy meant. I, I found out how much I love being a legislator along the way. Um, and, you know, my wife was able to kind of follow her career a little bit. She's got an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know, uh, she's working for Yum Brands and um, uh, basically was, was given the opportunity to, to move to Texas uh, for a job there, but decided that's not what she wanted to do. It was best for our family. So she kind of started her own consulting business here, then went from that and, and went back into a, a company that she was consulting for and, and has had some, some good career moves. It's, it's been, it's been good for us. It's been a good journey, but I think that's how I, how I got into it was just that kind of story saying, I'm going to do something to help getting into it, not thinking you're going to do it long, finding out I, I really love it. I love the work of helping people. Of all the things I loved about practicing law, like they're all there in being a legislator. You deal with laws, you deal with statutes, you argue, you, you testify, you, you almost depose people when they're in front of your committees um, and, you, and you get to help people, which is a really cool thing. Well, I love it. That leads me to my next question, actually. So I read that you're a member. We just talked about this, the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Caucus. And for those of you that don't know, that, don't know, that are listening, the Congressional Bipartisan HBCU Caucus was founded by Congresswoman Alma Adams on April 28, 2015. The caucus works to promote and protect the interests of HBCUs by creating a national dialogue, educating members of Congress and their staffs about the impacts um, the, the issues impacting HBCUs, drafting meaningful bipartisan legislation to address the needs of HBCUs. Um, so you wrote a law that allowed Simmons College, <laughs> Louisville's only HBCU to lower tuition costs for its students and restart its teacher training program, putting more black teachers into classrooms across Louisville and Kentucky. So I'm just really curious of all the things you could work on in the universe. <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, there's so many problems here and I'm sure people, the people of Kentucky have a lot going on, but what happened around you that you saw this gap and went in to fix something like that? Because I just am looking at you like, okay, what? <laughs> what? Um, I get it, and I take that as a compliment. It um, is a compliment. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's several things. First of all, I mean, I, I, I believe in the importance of HBCUs. I believe in the importance of black-led educational institutions. Um, I think it's also important to recognize not just the history of HBCUs, but our own history in education. Now, I mentioned my grandfather, who who is not just one of my best friends, but really one of my my heroes, uh, and how the GI Bill helped him. Well, let's talk about it was basically like winning the lottery if you were a black soldier and got GI Bill benefits after World War II. Um, and then look what happened. 
mean, neither the University North of Kentucky nor the University of Louisville were integrated at the end of World War II. There wasn't a place for, for soldiers uh, to go who fought for their country. And think about that, right? Like you, I'm, not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, and so, you know, I think recognizing that history, recognizing the importance of HBCUs. Um, and we're lucky to have two in Kentucky, one in Louisville. Uh, because as you know, an HBCU, you can't go out and create one. So if you're a city right now and you don't have an HBCU, too bad. You had to be in existence before, I think it's what, 1964, um, to be an HBCU. And with Simmons College here, we have it. And Simmons College had gone through a period where it was basically shut down. And we had a, a, an amazing group of people here, uh, led by Dr. Kevin Cosby, who said, we can revitalize Louisville's HBCU. They've, they've gotten it done. Um, think about what it does for our city. If we can have a thriving HBCU in the middle of Louisville, it is a win-win-win for every person and every part of our community. But through one of those quirks in the law, they were prevented still from having a program where black teachers could graduate from Simmons College. Now, there are reams of data out there. We can talk about personal experience and anecdotes all day long, but let's also talk about the data of how important it is to have black teachers in the classroom, mm -hmm. how this benefits students. Um, and the fact that one of our two HBCUs could not offer uh, a teacher training program, uh, I thought was, was basically criminal, uh, negligent at best, maybe worse than that. But so we went in and fixed it, right? Um, uh, making sure that HBCUs get the funding that I, I believe they deserve, recognizing the role um, that systemic racism has played in education in this country and how HBCUs can be a healing outlet for that. Uh, I saw that, you know, I, I've learned about it. I continue to educate myself about it. Um, and of course, did something about it on the state level and, and hope to, to add my voice and my efforts on the federal level as well. I love it. I mean, Vice President Harris, I mean, she, she graduated yeah. from an HBCU. So, I mean, I, you know, I have three black sons, so I do uh, really appreciate you talking about the value and importance of having black teachers. I mean, my sons have had very few black teachers, like in their whole career, their whole lives. And I don't think I had, I think the only black teacher I had growing up as a kid, I think was my gym teacher. I had a few, actually, I had a few yeah. by the time I got to high school. When I went to Whitney Young High School. So um, anyway, so I really love that. Thank you. Thank you for, for your service on that work because we do need help. I, the HBCUs are struggling. So um, I'm just glad that there's advocates out there because otherwise they're just not going to they're not going to survive. So I want to move forward and talk about Vice President Harris and her new grow small business and invest in entrepreneurs. I am shocked again to hear um, a presidential candidate talk about entrepreneurship. Um, I've always believed that we're unique and I'm kind of curious. I, I have a I have you know, a couple questions around this and I want to, I want to get your insights, but entrepreneurs versus small business owners, I see a difference. Um, and I, I do like small business owners. I'm a small business owner and an entrepreneur. Um, they are two different things to me. I have friends that are entrepreneurs, Congressman McGarvey, and they literally make from zero to like 25,000 a year. They're not, they're not hitting the $50 million SBA standard, right? At all. And so I feel like there does need to be a conversation or a definition change around, you know, small businesses versus entrepreneurs. And what I love about what I love about Vice President Harris is that she knows the difference. She says these two words in distinctive buckets because she knows a lot of women run a business off their kitchen table. They're making lip balms, you know, candles. You know, we're doing like making cookies or, you know, there's a woman I read about in Texas who um, every Halloween she runs around and like you know, deliver something to people to help them decorate their houses. And that's how she well, makes I her money. That, and she, right? Did like, you see that? I, I, I saw know, the right? article and, and apparently makes crazy money doing she it, by the way. But it's, yeah. a, it's a short time of the year. It's like, it's it's not like she does this all year long. Right. So I feel like, and even my company, so I have a company, Burke, Burke Design Inc., right? I'm a marketing agency. I'm not a fourth generation, uh, you know, business owner. And, you know, this is my first, this is my first company. I mean, I've been around for like 30 years, right? I'm not $50 million, but, um, I used to have discussions around entrepreneurship and small business owners. And I would actually tell my friends that were entrepreneurs like, hey, listen, you're not an entrepreneur anymore. You're a small mm -hmm. business owner. What does that mean? Right. That means that you can hire people <laughs> like you. You hire people. You know, you have probably insurance. There's just there's such a there's such there's just so many differences between the two. And I do think when she when Vice President Harris talks about entrepreneurs, she's talking to me. She can see me. She can see me and every other woman and man and other out there 
that are building stuff off their kitchen table. So I'm kind of curious, um, you know, you're a ranking member on the House Committee on Small Business with a focus on innovation, entrepreneurship, and workforce development. What is your desired outcome as you serve on this committee? Um, and how can your position help Vice President Harris, should she become president, reach her goals for small businesses and entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. And by the way, by the way, let me just mention one more thing. Yeah. That particular committee is mostly Republican. And I went on X to do research and I was like, oh, my God, they are very anti Vice President Harris. And I, I was shocked because I was like, I thought this was a bipartisan committee. But anyway, please help me understand how your role there can help her should she become president. Got it. And you've, get, you've given me a lot to unpack. So we're going to we're going to go. No, with, I mean, with I mean, but you know what? You're you're like super smart and amazing <laughs> and is, you're going to be able to do it. <laughs> no, no we, we've we've already established my wife is the one who's the super smart one. Um, the smart but, one? Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, her but, on the well, show. Get on um, up here. <laughs> but uh, I, we need to. She's great. So um, but uh, I think, you know, first of all, I, wanna, I do want to say because the small business committee is a bipartisan committee. Right. I mean, small businesses are the backbone of our economy. We every single congressional district in the country has successful small businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, we'll come back to that point because I agree with you on on talking about those two groups of people differently, oftentimes talking about them differently. Um, I, I've been really saddened by a lot of the partisan attacks recently, to be honest, because, you know, of course, before she was the nominee, the committee never talked about Vice President Harris a, as soon as. She's the nominee. Now it's all attacking her. Wow. And, and I, I think there is nothing to read into that other than sort of just plain partisanship attacking her because she's the Democratic nominee for president. Um, and, and so I, I don't I don't like to see that. Um, let's talk about you know, the, the entrepreneur. <laughs> person. Yeah, I mean, right. It's just it's it's we have a lot we can do in that committee to help people out. And I think you're right. I think if you're an entrepreneur or, or a small business, you can be both. It is possible to be both. And I think some people even start off as both. But at some point, you can kind of make a transition. Um, and Or you inherit a business, right? I, I, was in, um, I was doing a small business tour in a little community around Louisville yesterday and went into an awesome place. It's a cool place. He's the third generation barber. The barber shop has been in the exact same location since 1956. Do you remember the name of it? Uh, was it? Woody well, you know what? Like, get, get back to me. It's, 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 in, it's in Fairdale. And I'm now trying to remember the name of it because the guy who's yeah. the third generation, it's not his name on the sign. Um, but his oh, grandfather, right? His grandfather was a barber. His dad was a barber. Then he was a barber. served in the Marine Corps. Came. A great small business owner. I actually asked him this because we have to look it up. I said, are you the oldest continuing operating barber shop in Louisville? I think there's a chance he might be right. What a cool story, but he's a small business owner. Yes. He's not trying to open up another location. He's not trying to do something else. When I think of an entrepreneur, right? I think of that person who is, who is pushing that boundary, who is taking those risks, who is, who is trying to make something else. Not, it's not that one is good and one is bad. They're both great, but it is a different, um, it, it's a different, Sometimes it can be a different personality. Sometimes it can be a, a different skill set. You know, even I've dealt with entrepreneurs, um, both, in, both in my legal career and um, in, in policy. You get an entrepreneur, you might be able to start a business, and that's a skill set. But then you can't take it past a certain point. And then there's people who could take a business from a small business to a medium-sized business, and that's their skill set. But that they don't want to do anything else. And there's people who could even say, okay, look, you're a medium-sized business. My skill set is making you a large business, right? There's, there's all sorts of different skill sets. But I think it's good to talk about both of them. And when we talk about innovation, um, I think when we talk about innovation, we've got to talk about how to create more entrepreneurs. That is a pathway to the American dream that honestly is open to anyone. That it's, uh, it's so important. I want to say that again. The entrepreneurship, the pathway to the American dream, that is open to anyone. Uh, there is no educational barrier to entry. There is no, um, at least in theory, there is no other barrier to entry, whether it's sexism, racism, any other type of ism. It's just if you have a good idea and you can work hard, you can achieve that American dream. We have to help that make that a reality. So I think we have to recognize a few things that have kept people from being entrepreneurs. One, I think we have to, to see something I hear about all the time in Louisville. We hear about it in the committee. We hear about it from across the country. That is access to capital, 
right? So if you are starting with nothing, it is much harder to to go after those dreams. Um, you know, if you don't have something to fall back on, you can't get the capital you need to start your business. We have so to let me, recognize- let me let me let me just interrupt one second on that because that's actually yeah. a question I had. So I love that. I love that you're going to help people get access to capital, but it does depend on your business, right? So sure. I am in the thought leadership business. So I actually didn't have or need capital when I started my business because all of my ideas are in my head that I then share. Um, I'm not a manufacturer, so I don't need equipment. I don't need supplies. I don't need workman's compensation because I don't need staff, you know, like lots and lots of staff to build something or to run machines, right? So mm -hmm. I do think that that again, when we talk about entrepreneurship and small business ownership, it really depends on what you're going for. So for example, your wife, if she were to go back and be a consultant, yeah. she's gonna need like $1,000 paid in capital, that's it, to start a business. And a business credit, Good she question. can run off her printer, and then she could go sit at a table and get $1,000 an hour. You know what I mean? And that's kind of, so there, everyone doesn't need capital. And so that was actually you know, something, I had a woman on my show um, uh, last week, and she has a small business in Chicago, and she's a DJ company, and she actually was a, a driver at the convention. And she and I are kind of the same way. We're like, we don't want a loan. You know, we want contracts yeah. and we want opportunities to get business so that we can actually hit the ground money, running and make money right away. So I'm not trying to, I'm personally in my type of business, um, I really don't need a loan. I no. just need contracts. You know what I mean? So I, I, you know, and I guess that's kind of what I'm saying. Like when, when, when Vice President Harris talks about entrepreneurship and small businesses, mm -hmm. she knows that not every small business owner needs money. They actually need a client or a, or a, mm -hmm. or a customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, so I think there's a, there's, and so uh, you, you are correct. And there are lots of businesses that also need access to capital. So like we have to, and as policymakers, we have to think about the tools that are really available to us through the federal government. And, okay. and one of the big ones is funding, right? You know, like to some extent, if you're a DJ, I can't get you booked at a wedding. Um, you know, we, we can't, we can't make that happen. Right. But, but there but, was, but there was a DJ at the convention and her, she's convention. from Chicago, actually. Right. She was booked by the, she was booked by the DNC to, to run the, to run the parties. And, her name and, is Darlene know, Jackson. We're certainly intentional in our decisions, both on the official side and on the campaign side uh, about what type of vendors we hire for things. Right. And, and thinking of that, but, you know, and we can talk about it when you use the platform, but I think there are other things policy we can do as well. So, you know, Providing, making sure everyone has access to capital, including uh, minorities, women-owned businesses, groups that have faced traditional discrimination. Like I said, you know, in theory, um, there are no barriers to entry. We know in reality there are barriers to entry, and there are historic barriers to entry, and we have to we have to make sure that. I think there are other things we can do. Like I look at, um, we have a great business incubator here in Louisville called Amped, uh, run by a, a guy named Dave Christopher, um, which he is he's in West Louisville. Um, which because Louisville is a, a, a Southern town, we have a history of redlining. Um, and, you know, our, our, where people live is not always accidental here. Uh, we have to, we have to, we'll, uh, we know that history. Um, Chicago too, so, Chicago right. too, Congressman. Right. We have we redlining here. History. And Dave's in West Louisville in a redlined area of, of Louisville. Um, and one of the things he's doing, obviously he it's a business incubator. He's providing training. He's providing mentorship and coaching. And I think that's something good too. So if you're starting a business, even if it's a thought capital business, even if you're selling something off your kitchen table, it's going, okay, what do I do now? And what do I do next? Going, talking, being able to talk to somebody who's done it before you can bounce ideas off of, I think is one of those things that's really helpful. We can incentivize these types of mentors, coaching. The SBA can, can do a better job of this. There's things we can do again that are not loan-based but are, are based in what do you need right now? Um, there's also the training, right? The, the training that goes along with it. Uh, one of the things Dave Christopher does, he provides also fairs and opportunities for people to show what they're doing and, and get some exposure, those, those types of things. We can, you know, the, the federal government, again, even if, if funding is one of our big tools, we can help a Dave Christopher in every community in the country you know, who, are, who have these business incubators um, by helping them get other small businesses the tools they actually need. You know, one thing we continue so, to hear. Go ahead. Are, go you, ahead. are you, so the committee that you're serving on, which sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know if, if you've had conversations with Vice President Harris about the committee you're serving on. I mean, you did, actually you and your governor spoke, I believe at the convention, right? And you were speaking to small business owners and about small business yeah. concepts and ideas. Um, 
But this particular committee that you're on, you know, should she become president of the United States, what, like, what can you do to help her get to where she's trying to go with her platform, right? Like, what, what things could you be doing, aside from hopefully making those people on the committee not put such negative stuff on X? Like, <laughs> we got to fix that right away. But what can, what can you do in, in, in your space on that committee? And then by extension, how does that help, you know, someone like me? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat in Kentucky. So by my very nature, I'm an optimist. Um, and I love I'm gonna, that. I love yeah. you so much. You are so, you are so great. So so I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to say that after the election, hopefully some of the stuff you're seeing on X and some of the partisanship, hopefully some of that will go away. We will go back to the work that we're there to do, which is help create more entrepreneurs and to help small businesses. Um, okay. And, you know, I, I have, uh, I've talked to Vice President Harris. Uh, first of all, she's super smart. Um, she's absolutely all about helping people. She is tough. She is, you know, she's, she's a good leader. So, you know, we've, we've got those things um, that, that we've seen from her so far. Um, and I think we have to say, okay, how do we help entrepreneurs? How do we help small businesses? And I think we can think about it in two different buckets, even though it's like a Venn diagram, right? There's going to be some overlap. But I think we can think about it as two different buckets here. And uh, what we hear, we hear access to capital. We hear not enough training and opportunity. I think opportunity is key. One of the things the Biden-Harris administration has done a good job of is continuing to focus federal contracts on making sure that they are going to uh, minority and women-owned businesses as they are supposed to be going to those. So we, we've got capital. We've got opportunity. We've got coaching. Um, and I think we have to also, you know, see one of the things I hear is when you talk to small business owners, they will tell you, right, not every regulation is good. Not every regulation is bad. And, and how do we continue to have a regulatory environment that makes sense for our small business owners? Uh, yeah, and, she, talks and a lot. she, she did talk a lot. I mean, she's talking a lot about tax incentives and things like that, which sound mm -hmm. amazing. Um, I know that the accounting burden is pretty high on my company and I'm not even, you know, I'm not a $50 million company, right? But I have a huge accounting burden as mm -hmm. a small business owner. And I have a couple other businesses. I have a nonprofit called our journey of gratitude. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a whole different thing, but you know, you mentioned contracts. So I did read a statistic, $500 billion in contracts every year um, are, are spent by the federal government. And the law requires that 23% of these dollars be awarded to small businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, I read that this goal is not even close to being met, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I know from my own experience, Burke Design Inc., which is my company, I've had a very difficult time. You said a Venn diagram. <laughs> so this is why I love you so much. You said Venn diagram. Who says this? What representative in our government says Venn diagram? So I have had a really challenging time navigating that system to try to get access to some of these contracts. I mean, I have an ad agency, you know, and I have you know, media buying, marketing, all the things that the government needs a lot of, not only for recruiting, you know, but they need it to, you know, bring out information for public service. Like during the pandemic, for example, people really did not understand a lot about vaccines. <laughs> so it, was, it was shocking to find these things out. So they need companies like us to help. I can't figure out how to get through this. So why, why is this happening? Why, like you said, the goal is to try to help more women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses earn contracts, but it's still not working. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think one of the things I'm trying to do personally, and I, not, not to make any excuses at all, still in my first term in Congress, but I think you see, and this is where the committee is, is less partisan. Um, mm. And, and you know, we want, we want to figure out what that log jam is, right? Why is, why is the goal not even close to being met yet? And, and how do we help it? People. And I know the last thing anybody wants to hear is like that we're going to study something, we're going to do something. But but I think we have to figure out why that's happening, um, and then and continue to push to make it happen. With Vice President Harris, we're going to have a willing partner in that. Um, the, the Biden Harris administration already has been moving goals. You know, but like you said, she gets it. She sees she sees like the person in Louisville, Kentucky. The, we call her the cookie, cookie lady, Elizabeth Cazito. Um, uh, she'll tell you she was born in Uganda, one of 36 kids born under a banana tree, came to the United States. Wait, did you say 36 kids? 36 siblings. Um, and, you know, came to the United States, had never seen or tasted a cookie, created a cookie business and is now such a local legend. So she she's making these right like you're talking about making them 
uh, off the off the kitchen table, right, or, or wherever she's doing, and and probably she, in a kitchen, uh, like a large professional kitchen. I mean, I'm right, sure probably, it's you know with. And, she became such a beloved kitchen. figure through grit and hard work and talent and all these sorts of things that our our AAA baseball team now gives out bobbleheads of her. Um, <laughs> you know, right? Like this is the kind she's of got a bobblehead. She's got a bobblehead, right? Wow. I mean, this is like Who has goals. That? Um, these are life goals. Life and, goals. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, you know, like yeah, I mean, we we've got to make sure that we're, we're growing this type of spirit that we're giving people this opportunity that we're seeing every she Vice President Harris, I think, knows those stories all across America. And with a small business committee, we can I think we can push to continue making things better. So the thing about entrepreneurs, um, we know a lot of people and we recognize each other when we see each other. And um, we are a lot of us, whether you're an introvert or not, if you're a small business owner or entrepreneur, you know how to get business done. You try to go, you try to get business done. But I think a lot of us that it's like, it's almost like, oh my gosh, you finally figured it out. You're in America and you realize that America is a business. And if you're not, lever if you're not leveraging the tools that America has created to make it possible for you to have a small business or start a small business, maintain, grow and scale one, or even as an entrepreneur, you know, make enough money, you know, to cover the food on your table as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. If you're not recognizing these tools, then you're not taking advantage of what this country has to offer. And mm -hmm. that's why I love what you're doing on this committee and what Vice President Harris is talking about, because some kind of way, and it's, it's like a dog whistle for me. It's like, oh my God, these people understand, these elected officials understand that the way to, to success in the United States is through business. And it's, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's changing. And I love that you are working hard, not only to try to get people money, you know, capital loans, something that I'm not as interested in as getting a government contract, for example, for my business. But I love that you're saying, look, there's a whole bunch of things we could be doing to help. And Vice President Harris recognize it because she has friends. I know Vice President Harris has friends that have businesses off their kitchen table. She saw it in college. Mm -hmm. She saw it her whole life. She saw the struggle. She sees what's going on. And, and I don't know that we've ever had a president that really has seen that or gotten that to the extent that she has. And they, I'm sorry, but people that, that have even a side hustle, we outnumber, we outnumber people that work for corporations. I mean, we are a large voting block. And so, you know, it, it's real, like what, what we can do and what we can bring to the table. And, you know, if we can get in and have conversations with people like you, which is what I'm having right now, we can come and bring innovation and ideas and, and, and thought leadership to the process, you know, and it's not just like going to a town hall and talking to small businesses and, you know, or bringing them in on a virtual call with the SBA. It's like, literally, if you've got people finally that get in to our government and understand what we're talking about and what, what problems we're really having, I know change is going to come for us. I have no doubt in my mind about it. And you're an optimist. You said not, you're an I'm optimist. Not. You're from Kentucky. <laughs> you, you, you know, and it's, it's like you just said something that made me think of, of some other work we're doing, too. It's, it's not just seeing the people who are currently have those dreams at their kitchen tables, which is such a powerful part of, of I think, the American story. I think Vice President Harris also sees the people who aren't able to start those dreams at their kitchen yeah. table. And, and making sure that everyone has a shot. And w one thing, this is a, an area of... Um, I don't like, I always like to say bipartisan. To me, bipartisanship in today's world, it implies you agree. I think it doesn't mean to agree. I think it means the willingness to listen. And and so the bipartisanship, the listening, I think it's the nonpartisanship where we're coming together to solve a problem on, on this committee that you're, you're talking about where I'm on the subcommittee, uh, the chairman, a ranking member is a Republican from, from New York. And we've worked together on a bill to try and make sure that uh, people with disabilities also are not overlooked in the workforce and in entrepreneurship. Um, you know, it's making sure that every single person really and truly has a seat at the table, has what the, the tools they need. It could be capital. It could be coaching. It could be contracts. You know, it, it, it could be visibility, right? Whatever, it could be regulatory. Whatever that they've got, whatever they need, um, that we're trying to make it um, as conducive as possible. To, to start that business, to live that dream, to keep our small business economy, our entrepreneurship, our entrepreneurial spirit thriving here in this country. I love it. So, you know, we're almost out of time, but I've got to move forward to some rapid fire questions for you. Got and it. thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Um, you know, you're using all the words that make my heart soar. 
and 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 make and make my heart beat fast and and I get tingly. <laughs> like I mean, you use the word visibility, getting small business owners visibility. Like who says this kind of thing, right? Ex- unless except for someone that has real intimacy with small businesses and entrepreneurship. I mean, listen, your grandpa, like I need to meet him. I need to talk to him because obviously he instilled he instilled some powerful values in you about the power of ownership. It's it's really the power of ownership. It's it's an ownership mindset. It's 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 owning and creating something from scratch, right? And bringing it to life and seeing the results of that. And also, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, being able to do these things, you can, you know, help your family thrive. And you know, I have three children myself. I have three sons, and um, you know, they're they're. I'm in I'm in I'm in a little bit of a hellscape because they're that 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 16 to 20 year old age range, which is, I I mean, listen, I'm sometimes I wake up, I'm like. I just didn't know it was going to be this hard, right? I did not, I wasn't prepared to have this much work with my work with my children at the same time. You know, it's like crazy, but that's a different conversation. But um, <clears throat> I just think that- uh, And by um, the way, my hat's off to you for mom of three boys. Um, uh, you know, that that's, our our youngest got stung by a bee over the weekend at a soccer game. She had a complete go to pieces, uh, which is great. But the mom, of, <laughs> the mom of three boys ran to her car where she's got like the first aid kit the oh, breakable yes. ice packet, which I didn't even know exists because like, mm-hmm. you know, boys are just, it is a rough and tumble thing. It's wild. Um, yeah. yeah and- it's, it's wild. I got it. I got it. My youngest is a hockey, pl- hockey player. Uh, <laughs> my middle son is a division one volleyball uh, player at Merrimack wow. in Massachusetts. And my oldest is a uh, uh, elite jazz pianist in Manhattan school of music. Wow. So That's amazing. yeah, they're all high achievers, but they do kill. They're, they're killing me right now. They're all killing me. So listen, <laughs> rapid fire questions, rapid fire. Mis- Mr. Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what makes, and I do this all the time for my guests, what makes Lake Cumberland so beautiful? And can you share your best memory of it? Yeah. My best memory was the first walleye I caught down there in the second grade with my grandma. Uh, 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 my, my grandparents used to fish down there a lot, mostly for my grandpa later in Western Kentucky, but the Lake Cumberland, that's easily my best memory of Lake Cumberland. Uh, the natural falls down there are really, really pretty. Um, I think one of the prettiest things you can see Lake Cumberland, though, is when there's a there's a full moon out over Lake Cumberland, um, and, and and you can see it in that light is just really cool. I want it. I want it. Okay, so listen, I read your guitar player, which is yeah, and wild. I read you, you're a musician too, so this is. Yes. I mean, this is. Yes. I was hoping this would come up. <laughs> yes, yes. So my husband is a guitar player, and we have a band, a country band called Utah Carol, and we, you know, we love bluegrass, but. Um, and our band is Utah Carol, so please listen to our music. Um, but to what is sure. your favorite Kentucky bluegrass group, if there is one? And do you know how to play bluegrass? And do you play banjo too? I, I used to be able to pick out a few things on a five string, not much of anything at all. I mean, I'm, I'm a I'm a stumbling, bumbling amateur musician who doesn't have time for anything right now, but still loves it. Um, so I can play a little bit of this. Yes, we'll do it. My what favorite kind of guitar bluegrass. Do you have? I'll go with my favorite bluegrass group and recording from Kentucky. We have so many great bluegrass musicians from here. But if you get a chance to check this out, check out this recording. Um, it, 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 the song, one of the songs won a Grammy. Um, but the the Birchmere in, in near Washington, D.C., they brought together, you know, in these bluegrass bands, a lot of people would transition in and out of them. They brought together the best people who had played in these bluegrass bands over the years. And J.D. Crow, who's a native Kentuckian, a famous banjo player, um, he played in what they call J.D. Crow and the almost original New South. And it was J.D. Crow, Jerry Douglas on dobro, Ricky Skaggs on mandolin, Todd Phillips on bass, and Tony Rice on guitar. I think Tony Rice is also one of the best bluegrass flat pickers uh, of, of recent times. And they only played five or six songs together. It's called Bluegrass, the World's Greatest Show. Um, and uh, the, the song Fireball, I think, won a Grammy off of that. And if you want to hear some great bluegrass flat picking, hearing Tony Rice do a live version of the Freeborn Man on that CD is worth the free price you'll pay for it on Spotify. Wow, that is incredible. I, I love musicians too. You got all the goods. You got all the goods. All right. So if you could name a horse in the Kentucky Derby, what would you name it? Chips and Salsa. Oh my God, you didn't even, you didn't even hesitate. You didn't even hesitate. You did not even hesitate. No. What the heck? I, I love, love that. Chips okay. and Salsa. I love the Derby. Let's go. Let's go. We're winning. <laughs> I love it. Okay, where should I go to get the greatest Kentucky barbecue? Do you have a Do you have a suggestion? Yeah, you know, this is like asking me which is my favorite child. I knew it. I knew you were going to say I, that. I, knew I have one, but I can't tell you. Um, I know. I'm I just know. Kidding. I just couldn't I'm kidding. resist. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Um, okay. No. So every I will tell you this in Kentucky, 
Um, I always have, I've got to go. We've got a lot, a lot of great barbecue here. Western Kentucky really is the area of Kentucky that's known for its barbecue. So, okay. okay. All right. So I'm a vodka drinker. Mm -hmm. So what authentic Ken Kentucky bourbon would I like and how can I get a bottle of it? Fantastic. Um, so I think the first thing you have to recognize is uh, bourbon has to be at least 50% corn, has to be aged for at least two years in a new charred white oak barrel. There's a few other things, but those are like the basics, right? After the 50% corn, you can have a lot of different natural ingredients in there. And so what I would ask you is, do you like a bourbon that has more of a bite or do you like a smoother bourbon? You know, I probably want the smoother because I love the feeling that I, when I've had bourbon of like this mm -hmm. warm like blanket covering my, like goes from my head all the way down to my toes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you three that you could find um, that are, I'll go with like a lower price bourbon that punches way above its weight. The old Forester 86, you can find it basically anywhere in that $25 a bottle range. It's great. Um, pour it over ice, mix it with something, drink it however you like. It's a great bourbon. The Elijah Craig small batch is also a little bit smoother. Um, little, both of these bourbons have more of a corn profile, which gives it a little sweeter taste. Um, and then uh, Maker's Mark, which is a weeded bourbon. Um, all three of those are are reasonably priced. You'll be able to find them on a shelf anywhere. Like, I don't want to be the jerk that tells you the best bottle of bourbon in the world. Yes. And then you're going to spend the next 10 years looking for it. And when you <laughs> find it, it's $200 for the bottle if you find it at face value, right? But those are like three kind of good across the board bourbons um, that you can find anywhere. And once you find what you like, it's like wine, right? It's like wine. Once you find the kind of wine you like, then you can start experimenting a little bit more and get into some of the different taste profiles in those $55 to $60 bottles. I have one more question for you. The only fried chicken my mother will ever eat is KFC. Yeah. She's obsessed. So what is your favorite single item at Kentucky Fried Chicken? Right now, I'm going with the nuggets. They have I nuggets that will rival anybody. So I mean, <laughs> why? First of all, why KFC doesn't have a breakfast sandwich is beyond me because those 11 original herbs and spices on a breakfast sandwich would be delicious. They miss the boat. Um, I'll tell them that. I'll tell you that. Uh, but they, they've got nuggets right now. You go get those nuggets and fries. Yes, I've had them. If you, and for the people who haven't, you're letting the best in life pass they you by. Are, they are so, those nuggets <laughs> are so damn good. Oh, good. I am sorry. I got to stay away from that. I, they are the best. Well, listen. This was such a wonderful conversation, um, Congressman McGarvey. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You all can find out more about the congressman by conducting a search using generative AI tools like ChatGPT or perplexity.ai. Just type in Morgan McGarvey and you will find out everything you need to know. But of course, you can always use Google. We can always use our favorite Google. So thank you so much for joining me on the, joining me on the Honest Field Guide podcast. And we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Ginger, thank you so much for having me. This was, this was a blast. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time, everybody. The Honest Field Guide is produced by the team at Burke Creative, where brand and multi-channel strategies are designed to help you get attention, grow, scale, and keep up with the pace of change. The music on the podcast is written and performed by Utah Carroll. You can find their songs everywhere online to buy or stream. The opinions expressed on the Honest Field Guide are solely those of the hosts and guests.